So without further ado, let me hand over now uh, to uh, Joanna Banieska, uh, one, of, one of our committee who is going to introduce tonight's speaker. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bob. Um, so it's my great pleasure to introduce our speaker tonight, who's Manuela Gonzalez Suarez from the University of Reading School of Biological Sciences. She's Associate Professor in Ecological Modeling and she specializes in predicting biodiversity loss. And within that, she looks at life histories, at um, ecological and behavioral traits that might influence extinction risk and also invasion success, so both sides of, of the coin as well as something that we'll focus more on today, which is anthropogenic impacts, um, because her talk today is looking at how roads affect animals. Um, and she's also looking at the importance of individual variations for population dynamics. Um, but today her talk is called Why Did the Rhino Cross the Road? And um, if you um, want to get in touch with Manuela later, she's very active on Twitter. So do follow her on at MGS underscore tweets. Um, and she also does post very interesting papers very often. So I do recommend following her if you are on Twitter. Um, so that's Manuela. And uh, I'm very much looking forward to listening to her talk now. Over to you, Manuela. Well, thank you so much. I'm going to try to get this share screen thing going. Um, I apologize because I think it's going to take me a couple of seconds. We found there were a couple of issues before, but hopefully now I got them down. All right. Hopefully um, now you've seen these. Um, let me see if I can see you because otherwise you're somewhere else. Um, well, I'm, I'm not sure how to see you. So I'm not, I'm not able to see you at this time, but um, I could hear, so if there is any audible signals, I will, list, I will recognize it. So yes, today I wanna to tell you a little bit about work I've been doing with uh, several collaborator collaborators. And our interest is to understand how roads and the associated traffic can cause impact on wildlife. And particularly today, I'm gonna to be talking about mammals. And while my work today isn't gonna be specifically in the UK, I hope it will be of interest because roads and traffic are definitely also a problem here in the UK. Roads are not really a new thing. There we go. Roads are not really a new thing. And humans have been building roads since Roman times. The map on the left actually shows the road network that existed during Roman times in Britain. So there's quite already quite a lot of roads in there, but it's really been in the last couple of centuries when roads and vehicles have become widespread and prevalent features in nearly all landscape on the planet. So in this map here, the land surfaces of the planet have been... Oh. Okay, sorry, it just told me the, the meeting has been recorded. <laughs> um, so in this map here of the world, the, um, the land surfaces are painted on white. And on top of that, using fine black lines are painted all of the main paved roads. There's so many of these roads in some areas that we just see basically a black area. And in fact, in more than 50% of the land on our planet, there is a road closer than one kilometer away. There's been quite a lot of change since those Roman roads in the UK. And the image on the right here is actually an image from the night. And we can see the light. So the roads can actually be seen, not just because we can look at these infrastructures and then map them, but even at night, we can actually see the signal that they generate and we can see there's a lot more of these. Of course, roads can be quite beneficial for us. They allow us to travel to work, to school, to visit family and friends. And when there are lorry drivers available, they allow for goods to Our be road, transported yeah. between... Sorry? Road, yeah. Okay, I, I think I, I hear somebody else, but maybe it wasn't for me. Um, when there are enough lorry drivers, they allow for uh, goods to be transported from factories and ports of entry into stores and our homes. Of course, roads can also cause some problems. So here is some information on fatalities in uh, road accidents in Great Britain. So many people are injured and killed on roads. We can see here in the last 40 years, the number of people who died on road accidents has been steadily decreasing. But the not so good news is that it's still in 2019, 
there were nearly five people dying each day on roads. Anybody who lives near a road is also probably quite aware of the fact that roads bring a lot of pollution. We already saw that map of night light, so there's a lot of light that's been emitted from the roads and the traffic that circulates on those roads. But also, roads can be a source of noise and chemical pollution. So these two maps come from the UK website, from the government website, and in, in the bottom left one, we can actually see the noise. So the M3 and the M4 that are roads probably near to many of us, the signal of that noise is quite loud. And it's not just the road itself that is loud, it's actually the adjacent landscape. It also has kind of the signal carries away. And similarly, looking at um, different chemicals, we can see, for instance, here, carbon dioxide. We can see not only the big cities, but also that road network. So roads pose a lot of problems for humans, and some of those are also problems for wildlife. So for wildlife, actually, the first problem is that when a road is built, it replaces the previous habitat, often natural landscapes in which there was natural vegetation. And when that occurs, some of the habitat is lost. And during construction, often it's not just the road path itself that is lost, the adjacent areas also become at least temporarily disturbed. While machinery has to have access, people might be uh, residing near the work areas. Not only roads kind of they change the landscape and, and, and lose some of it, the ones that build, they are actually fragment. Even if we have natural landscapes on either side of the road, those two used to be united and now they become fragmented. And these, if animals are reluctant or unable to cross the road, can be a problem because animals that are now on one side of the road might not be able to access resources on the other side. And these resources could be uh, food, could be um, water, but they can also be mates. And if we have an original population that wasn't very big, and maybe now it's been divided in two by the road, and individuals cannot mate with each other, we can end up having problems of inbreeding and eventually have extirpation or the local extinction of a population. As with humans, roads also are a source of pollution for animals. And for instance, on birds, it's been found that um, animals that live near roads have to sing louder to be heard by other uh, competing animals or, by att or to attract mates. And this means that they're spending more energy to sing and therefore they cannot use that energy to basically improve their survival or to invest in their reproduction. So they're, they're having lower fitness. The problem I want to talk about today is the fact that roads also cause mortality for wildlife. This picture here is actually the first leopard I ever saw in his natural habitat. And it was quite sad because it was actually a roadkill just outside Kruger National Park in South Africa. And while my talk today is not going to be about lepers in South Africa and mortality, I think it signals the idea that this is quite a widespread phenomenon. It can happen for all of us, a different number of animals. So what I want to tell you about today is a study that we published with some collaborators last year. And what we asked is how big of a problem is road mortality in Europe? Now, I want to start by actually telling you kind of the end of the story. And this is the end of the story. We look at birds and mammals and we estimated 194 million birds and 29 million mammals are killed each year on European roads. Now that's a big number. And what I want to tell you now is how we got to that number. You might think that what we did was to actually make a huge effort, go and sample all European roads, count all dead animals we found, and see um, how many we had in total. Unfortunately, although ideal, that would be really expensive and very time consuming. So instead, what we proposed is that we could look at what data was available, see if we can identify some common patterns, and then use those patterns to extrapolate information, infer information about those areas and species for which we did not have yet information. So the first thing we wanted to know is what information was available. And for that, we were interested in what we call roadkill systematic surveys. So a systematic survey, the main thing is that the effort is consistent and quantified. So the same road section or sections would be sampled repeatedly. So we know the area that has been surveyed. We know how long it is. It's been sampled ideally by the same observers or observers that are all equally trained. And this is important because while seeing that leopard in South Africa wasn't very difficult, you can imagine that being able to notice a small bat or a small rodent can be a lot more complicated. So we want people who are able to detect all of the different species that might become roadkill. 
The road sections should be uh, surveyed at regular intervals, ideally more than once a week. In fact, probably ideally about once a day. You can imagine that's actually a lot of effort. And the reason for this is because roadkill can happen quite frequently, but for some animals, they can quickly disappear as well. So if you imagine particularly a small animal, if it gets run over and it dies on the road, two things can happen. A scavenger can come in and pick it up and it will disappear. But also if many vehicles continue driving on top of the, that animal, eventually it might completely disappear um, or become almost unrecognizable. And not only you should do a survey quite regularly, but you should, you, one should also do it for an extended period of time, ideally several months. And the reason for this is that we both want to capture seasonality in the animal movement. Some animals might be moving more at different times of the year, but there is also seasonality in driving patterns. So we also want to capture the fact that there might be more or less traffic at different times of the year. So ideally several months, even longer if possible. Now, roadkill systematic surveys are what we were interested in because it's the ideal way to control for effort and therefore best allow us to um, be able to compare different regions and different species, which is what we wanted to do when we're trying to address the question of how many, uh, how big a problem for European uh, mammals and birds is our drug kill. But this is not the only way. There is also citizen science uh, projects that can collect roadkill data. Now, I want to highlight this one here in the UK. is a project I am not involved with, but I think is very neat. And what they do is they're basically asking individuals, members of the public, to report any roadkill they find. So this is relatively easy. If you find roadkill, you can send the coordinates of where the animal was found. You can send photos for identification. And all of this data is collected. And you can see on the right side, there is a map. And there are lots of blue dots in there that represent all of the re reported roadkills that they have found um, in the UK. So these records are a bit more difficult to compare because, for instance, we have relatively few records in Scotland that could reflect the fact that there are fewer roads, but there is also fewer drivers, fewer observers that might be uh, in that area. So it becomes more difficult to use this data, but it doesn't mean that it doesn't exist. And I do want to highlight this project because all of you could contribute if you're interested. But let's go back to what we did. We needed to find systematic surveys in Europe. So we search on the scientific peer review literature, but also on the gray literature. And we found 90 roadkill surveys. These were studies that have used this systematic approach for which we have recorded effort and had reported how many birds and mammals um, had been killed. These data did not cover all of Europe, but they actually represented 22 different countries. They're listed there. And you can actually see in the map as well, the black dots represent the location of the different um, surveys that we had. In total, these studies reported roadkill rates for 75 mammalian species. And because some studies in the some species have been found in more than one study, we ended up with 342 estimates of roadkill rates. Most of these studies actually report how many animals they found dead over the period of the study. But of course, we needed to be able to compare different studies. So if we had a study that had sur survey 50 kilometers of road for three months, and another study that looked at 200 kilometers of road over a year, we expected that the total count would be higher in the second, even if the actual probability of being road killed would be the same. So what we did is we took that effort into consideration and calculated a rate, which is the average number of individuals that were found dead for each kilometer of road in the total year, in a year. So how does that look like? What does that data look like? And here I'm going to show you both birds and mammals. So, but for the rest of the talk, I'll be concentrating mostly on mammals, given the, uh, the audience. So in this graph, we can see on the horizontal or x-axis is the stroke kill rates, these individuals per a kilometer per year. They're on a logarithmic scale because their values change, are so different across different observations that we needed to basically make them in a really big scale to be, to be comparable. As a reference, 10 to the power of zero, so that's that last number on the right, is equal to one on a standard scale. On the vertical or, uh, y, or y axis, we actually have the number of uh, records for different species. So the first thing that you might notice is that, again, I already highlighted the values are quite different. We have some species that are very rarely found as roadkill, and others are quite frequent. I, show, I decided to show both birds and mammals in here so that you can see that this happens in both taxonomic groups. 
And if you remember, I mentioned this last number, the 10 to the power of zero, which is equal to one, was um, is there. And you can see there's a few species that actually have more than one individual per kilometer of growth per year in their this being reported. So which ones were our top roadkill species? Well, I'm just showing you two. Of course, we have the data for all of them, but the highest values that we found in these systematic surveys corresponded to the southern white breasted hedgehog. This is a species mostly found in Eastern Europe. And the, rec the record came from a Russian study, and they have 15.8 individuals per kilometer per year. That is more than one individual per month per kilometer of road. It was a really high rate. We don't have actually estimates of um, small mammals for the UK, but as a reference, I have been checking what, how many, how often were hedgehogs, the European hedgehog, the one that's found here in the UK, in this project splatter where people report roadkill. And hedgehogs are indeed very frequently in their top most reported species. So probably hedgehogs in general are quite susceptible to roads. The second highest rate was for actually species that is found here, here is the sopa soprano pipir trail. And the record came from a study that was done in uh, roads from the Czech Republic and Austria. And the values were 8.7 individuals per kilometer a year. So again, quite high numbers. I already mentioned that in the UK, we didn't have data for small mammals, but we did have one study that had looked at the mortality of deer only on main motorways. So this is quite a, a specific study. And this often happens. Some people survey everything they find, other people kind of decide to have a target. And these are the values they find. They found for the three species that are uh, native to Europe. You can see these values are much smaller, but this doesn't actually mean that they are not very often roadkill because if you notice, I mentioned they looked only at motorways. And I suspect, Many deer are also killed on less, um, on secondary or smaller roads where animals might actually feel more comfortable crossing. There's less traffic, less disturbance, but there's still enough traffic to actually every now and then have a collision. And in fact, even just looking at motorways, in that same study, they basically provided a map of across England, how likely is one to hit a deer on different motorways. And so the redder colors here represent a higher probability of hitting a deer, having a deer vehicle collision, as they call it. So you can see that of, even though on average it's a relatively low risk, there are some areas where the risk can be quite high. So at this point, we had some data that represented about one third of the species that lived in, uh, mammal species that lived in Europe and provide us 90 locations. But what we wanted to know is if we want to assess the problem for all the species in all areas, what can, what can we do? And what we propose is that we, can, we could come up with a model. We can come up with a way to use information we have for all the species to basically infer or predict the information we don't have. And to test that idea, the first thing we did is to say, well, since we do have roadkill for several species in several locations, can this information that we have for others be useful? So we will look at these pieces of information and see if we can predict observe roadkill rates, and then if that works, then maybe we can basically try to predict roadkill for other groups. So we thought there were three kind of key pieces of information that were important for roadkill. The first one was how the survey was designed. So we already incorporated how long was the survey carried out and how uh, long was the road, but we wanted to incorporate the interval between the surveys. Location was also important. This is because we know roads have different features in different areas, so how, how curvy is a road um, will influence how detectable can be an animal on the road, and therefore how likely is an accident to occur. How close the vegetation is to the road might also influence how likely is an animal to get close to the road and decide to cross it. Um, might also influence detectability. Can, an, can an, a driver see the animal early before he crosses the road and basically adapt his response? We also know that driver behavior, how fast people drive, how aware are they of road kills can also vary by location. So we knew location will be important. But what we wanted to test, what was a bit more novel about a study, was this idea that how a species look like, how they behave, and, how, and their ecological preferences could actually also influence the observed road kill. 
If anybody's curious, what we use is what is called a random forest regression model, which is basically a statistical tool that allow us to look for this relation. So we used a lot of different traits, and I just want to give you a few examples here of things that we tested and explain why we thought they would be important. So we look at body size, we expected larger mammals to actually have lower road kill rates. This is for a couple of reasons. The first one is that animals that are larger tend to be more mobile, and we expected them to be able to cross the road faster and to also be able to react faster if a vehicle approach. So get out of the way. But also, larger animals will be more visible to a driver, which, who might have then time to slow down or deviate his course to allow the animal to cross. And in fact, when the animals are quite large, drivers might very, very actively avoid collision because a collision with a big animal like a deer can actually result in damage to the vehicle and the injuries to the driver and the passengers. We also hypothesize that animals that are more locally abundant, that is, they have higher population density values, will be more likely to become roadkill. There are more animals, more likely, therefore more might be on the road and more might suffer uh, as victims of roadkill. As I mentioned before, sometimes roadkill might not be found because the scavengers take it. Therefore, we expected that scavengers might be attracted to roads. And when you're attracted to road to pick up on the roadkill, you might become roadkill yourself. Animals that have a wide home range size, they use a larger area of the landscape for the regular activities. They might increase the probability of them have, uh, encountering roads and needing to cross them to access the different resources. So we expected they might actually have also higher road kill rates. And finally, the last example I want to give is about nocturnal activity. So we hypothesize that animals that are more active at night will have higher road kill rates. This is because we, for two reasons again, actually. First, um, at night, we have lower visibility, so drivers might not be able to see animals on the road as quickly. But also animals at night might be blinded by the lights of the vehicle and might actually freeze and stop in the middle of the tracks rather than try to get away, which will increase the risk of collision. So did our hypothesis that these things work actually work? Well, it did. I'm going to show you some examples here, but yes, indeed, we found that survey design location and a number of traits were important to explain the road kills we had, they had been recorded in those studies. And I'll just show you three of the things that I already discussed. So in these graphs, you can see on the um, horizontal or x-axis, we have the different uh, traits. So we have body mass, we have population density and nocturnal activity, which is simply a score as zero, meaning no, and one meaning yes. And then in the vertical or y-axis, we have the predicted road kill rates. And you can see here is that the small mammals that lived at high densities and are active at night did indeed have higher uh, road kill rates. So we mentioned the hedgehogs before, the pipistrelle bats as well, other types of bats are also quite high road kill. And then also the commoners group was one of the ones that we found um, high road kill. So our next step was to say, well, can we use this information? Can we use this detected relationships to make predictions for the 212 mammalian species that are native to Europe and for all locations. And for that, we decided to divide Europe in 50 by 60 kilometer grid cells. So basically we created the squares and we said, let's imagine we did a survey in the center of each of, each of those squares, what would happen? So we use a survey, location and traits again to make predictions. So just to show you how that works, I created an example with the European, European hedgehog, the one that we have here in the UK. Um, this is what we did for one species, but you imagine we actually did this for all 212 species. So what we did for all of them is we actually assume that the survey had been done using an average protocol. So we took the median survey interval from all the data we had and say, let's assume this is how this study was done. And then we have all our 50 by 50 cells in Europe. They're shown there in that little map where you can see kind of the little um, gray little cells in there. And we superimpose the distribution range of each species. In this case, this is the distribution of the Euro European hedgehog. This is um, extracted from the IUCN distribution maps. And so what we did now is we say, well, in each, in each square where there is expected to be a European hedgehog population, we just basically said, let's estimate the risk. And now for all of the species, we basically had a series of traits. So these are an example of some of the traits that we had collected for the hedgehog. And so this actually gave us an estimate of roadkill rates for each of those cells in which the hedgehog was found. 
I just showing you here is the average across all of those. So that was a 0.17 individuals per kilometer per year. But across different areas of Europe, we actually had different risks. And that was simply based because location actually had an impact. And so those values range from 0 0.09 to 0 0.38, just to give you an example. So then what we did is we had all of this data. We did this for 212 species, and we then put it together. So now for each of the cells, we actually have an estimate of roadkill for all of these species, mammalian species, that we could find in that particular cell. And this is what we got. So this is the map where each of the cells represents the number of roadkills. And when you add all of these numbers, it gives you 29 millions per year. Now, some of you might have noticed, wait a minute, but you were telling me about individuals per kilometer per year. How did you get to total number of individuals per year? Well, in each of those grid cells, we actually had data on how many kilometers of roads there are. So what we did was simply to multiply those two numbers. And we said, instead of having the number of individuals per kilometer per year, if we know how many kilometers there are, then we actually have the number of individuals total per year. So when we added all of the different species, what we find is that we get 29 millions in total. But we also, when we look at the different locations, we can see that risk is by no means uniform. There are some areas where we have relatively few expected road kills and areas where we actually have very high numbers. I want to point out here that the range goes from one individual per year to 73,000 individuals per year. So that's a big difference between different regions. And this is a combination of more species that might be more vulnerable due to their characteristics, but also due to the higher density of roads in some areas. Now, I really didn't want to talk only about dead animals. Um, so I wanted to share some of the other, some other work I've been doing looking at other types of road impacts, and particularly looking at impacts that are associated with changes in behavior. This is, um, I mentioned a couple of publications here, and I'll actually at the end, I forgot to mention before, that I'll show um, the slides for, um, I'll provide the references in case anybody is curious and wants to read more. And in the previous study, you can also read the results for the birds as well, if you're interested. So looking at these other impacts, and, and what, part of the reason why I wanted to share this work is because this is actually quite dear to me. So. For the previous study, what I did was to take people data that other people have collected, and I sat on my computer and I calculated some models and I calculated some numbers. For these studies, I actually was able to do the field work myself, and we were quite lucky. We actually did this field work in protected areas in South Africa, so much more excited than sitting in my computer here at Reading. And this is just a photo of uh, my colleagues, they're very close friends, that uh, we did these surveys together. So we, we chose South Africa, actually, because it combined a number of interesting things. First, it has a lot of wildlife we were interested in understanding, but also it has a lot of protected areas. And a lot of these protected areas have high um, visitor, number of visitors, and most of them visit from motorized vehicles. The reason for that is that uh, protected areas in South Africa have quite dangerous animals. So one doesn't really want to be walking around, but rather you drive. And just to give you an example of how actually dense these roads can be and how busy they can be, uh, our first study was actually in Kruger National Park, probably the best known uh, park in South Africa. In this park, there is 2,300 kilometers of road and 850 of those are paved roads. And these roads are visited by 1.5 million visitors each year. There's a lot of cars. And in fact, when I was there, one of the things I found most shocking is the fact that one could get into kind of traffic jams when you're visiting the area. The map on the left um, might be hard to see, but actually shows the main uh, roads and secondary roads. So what we can see is, except for the north, where there is some areas that are basically roadless, pretty much everywhere in Kruger, we probably can have an access to roads. So what we wanted to do in this area was to ask whether these roads, this traffic, these, these different structures that are necessary because tourists provide funds for protecting these areas and ensuring these are kept as conservation resources. But could they also be impacting negatively the fauna that we're trying to protect? So what we did is we chose a study of species that 
is not of any conservation concern, but is very abundant. So it was very nice to do a study because we actually could ensure that we would collect a lot of data in relatively a short time. So we study impala, which are an African uh, antelope. They're very common. And not many tourists will stop for them, but we did for our study. So that's always kind of people looked at us a bit curious when we were stopped and look at impala. So what we ask is, are impala kind of less likely to be near roads? We know certainly they cross it. This is a group of impala crossing an unpaved road. No problem. We saw these very regularly, but they're just crossing. You can see they're kind of moving relatively fast in there just based on the position of the legs. Will they be avoiding kind of the proximity of roads and particularly those paved roads where we have higher levels of traffic, people drive a bit faster. Could that be a disturbance that these animals were avoiding? And so what we did is we survey a number of roads within Kruger National Park, and we basically recorded how far impala that we cited were from different parts of the, from the road. And because we had data on the type of road, then we can infer whether we had seen difference. What we found is that indeed, impala are less abundant than expected within 10 meters of paved roads. This doesn't mean they're not found near paved roads. It just means that they seem to be avoided slightly the proximity of those roads. 10 meters might not seem like a lot, but when we think about the fact that there are 850 kilometers of paved roads in Kruger, 10 meters to either side of those 850 kilometers actually represent a fairly substantial amount of habitat that has become less accessible, less desirable for these impala. And when maybe impalas are not species that one think, oh, we don't have to worry too much, but because they're actually quite abundant. They're also an important prey for many predators, some of which we do worry about. And also because they're very abundant, they're important ecosystem engineers. They eat a lot of the vegetation in these parks. And that actually, if they're avoiding certain regions, can actually have an effect, can actually alter how some of these regions might be affected. So we find in Kruger National Park, that impala seems to be avoiding some areas in close proximity to the roads. What we wanted to do next is to see whether these actually also occur in other ungulates, African ungulates, and if we could also do something similar to what we have done with the road kills and use traits to try to understand um, how different species might react. And if we could understand it, could we use it to predict? Could we try to generate an assessment of which of the different species might be more vulnerable to roads and traffic? So this time we went to three different uh, protected areas in South Africa. We visited um, Umfalothi, we, uh, um, Umkise, and Pilanesburg, Umkusi. Okay, sorry about that. And Pilanesburg. So there are different areas and, and we wanted to see if all of the ungulate species that we see, so we have from giraffe to rhinos to dikers, so from big to small, anything that we could find, we asked two questions. How far are they from the road? And when we drive in, if we stop to take our measurements, do the animals respond to that? In particular, do we see a flea response? A flea response is what often animals do in, when a predator appears or when they're startled or scared. So in this case, what the animal do is it stops whatever activity they're doing and basically runs away. So we recorded how often this happened. And our idea is that perhaps some animals might be more likely to show these flea responses. And because when that happens, an animal is basically spending energy to move away rapidly, but also is stopping whichever behavior it was doing. It means that the, um, we basically could see a negative impact of these roads and this landscape. We're not saying there is a solution we should stop roads and visitors, but maybe we just need to consider which species are being impacted and what can we do. So what did we find? Well, indeed, we actually found that traits could help us predict um, some, of these, um, some of this risk. And a smaller, solitary, non-grazer ungulates like bikers were more likely to flee in the presence of the vehicle. So, with this information, we can now try to understand what a species might be more vulnerable. So if we are developing new roads, maybe it's important to understand which types of species are used in the landscape, but also understanding species that might be more susceptible or that respond more to certain impacts can allow us to monitor those particularly. So hopefully our results not only give us some insight into how different species are impacted, but also can provide us a way to do future research. 
Now, this is staged. Some of you might be wondering, well, well, why did the rhino cross the road? And I'm afraid this, the answer is pretty silly. And it's, of course, because they wanted to get to the other side. So I hope um, you've enjoyed this. As I mentioned, these are the studies that I've covered today. So two in South Africa and one in Europe. And I also wanted to highlight with the same, with a similar team that I had worked in Europe, we just published a few days ago, a study in which we look at the impact of road kills for mammals across the entire planet. So at this time, I'm happy to take any questions, um, if there are any, and I'll see if I can figure out how to get you back in my screen. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, Manuela. That was a great talk. Um, I'm waiting for questions to appear in the chat. Um, but I was wondering before, um, before anybody asks, since uh, I'm here, I've got access to, to the microphone. Um, have you also compared um, other places that might be similar in character to South Africa? And I'm thinking about Australia because it also has a lot of roads that go through national parks and the character is slightly different because they actually have big lorries delivering um, goods from one side of a national park to another. But roadkill is a very big problem. And I was wondering if you had a kind of more global insight um, or were you focused mainly on particular geographical regions? So the sure answer is no, I haven't, I haven't worked in other areas on this topic. Um, partly because some of the work um, I wanted to get going was affected by the pandemic, as I imagine many people are. So this is kind of my, let's go out there and do things. <laughs> and then the pandemic came. But I, um, I think there is, um, there is probably, I don't know if all the species across, there will be a clear pattern on, on, in terms of which species are most susceptible. Perhaps by area, there'll be different patterns, but I wouldn't be surprised. I mean, we did a hypothesize smaller animals might be more frightened simply because they're more likely to be prey. So an elephant is probably not very scared of many things, whereas a small um, antelope might be quite uh, quite frightened if it sees a big thing. And solitary animals might also feel more vulnerable because sometimes it's a group effect. You less likely to be eaten if you're in a group. Maybe you can run faster than the slowest one. So I expect there are some generalities. The actual modeling bit might be different in this case, and is definitely an interesting question. I do want to mention I actually have, um, even though I haven't been able to go abroad, one of my current PhD students is looking at roadkill in Ecuador. So he hasn't looked at behavior and partly is because um, studying behavior requires a lot, often a lot longer and having high vast visibility. And for that, I think the African savanna is quite unique. You have high density of animals and high visibility, which you might not have in other places. But Australia is probably a good one too. Great, thank you very much. Um, Bob, uh, would you like to take over of oh, Alison? Um, no, it's okay. Bob just rang me to say he's having problems with his um, computer. He doesn't know if he'll be able to do it. So I don't know, Joanna, okay. if you can take the questions or if you want me to go or take- Go ahead, Alison, by all means. Okay, okay, well, right, Bob normally does this, but I'll ask my question first because I knew what that was. Um, well, uh, thank you. That was a fantastic talk. Really, really interesting. I wondered, particularly in the European study, whether maximum speed limit on the roads was something that you took into consideration and whether that made a difference. So I actually, um, the short answer is no. <laughs> and partly that's because um, even though the speed limits, uh, we know they're likely to be important. It's actually not very clear in which ways they might be important. It's similar to traffic. Um, and the, we might think that higher traffic means more road kills because there's more cars and therefore more animals could be hit. But in fact, animals uh, often respond and avoid areas that have a lot of traffic. So it's actually not a very clear consensus in the literature of what is worse. The same with the speed. So if you're going fast, you're passing through an area of the road quite fast, the animals might not there cross. So what, even though there's no study that has clearly demonstrated, I, my suspicion is that probably is those middle roads, the kind of like the country roads, where you can drive fast enough to hit something, but animals are not so frightened um, or not seeing traffic constantly, like might happen in a motorway and, and there to cross. 
And I actually, um, I had meant to say, and I forgot that one of the uh, caveats with our number, so this is an estimate, um, is the fact that we only had data for primary uh, paved roads in Europe. Right. So we don't have data for kind of like much smaller um, or even end paved roads that do exist in many parts of Europe. And I suspect there is a lot of mortality that occurs on those, even though there, there is less traffic, they often occur in areas where there are more animals and more wildlife. Mm. So having those two numbers, I think, would really make a difference. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Thank you. Helen Morehouse has said, have you seen any impact of roadkill on populations? I reckon that might be hard to study, but certainly it's very, and when you talk about the hedgehogs, I mean, we know hedgehogs are in serious decline in this country, so it's very depressing to hear that they're the predominant target, but is that something you've studied? So it almost is in a platter. So the second part of our uh, roadkill study in uh, Europe, and actually the key part of the one that I mentioned for global, um, across all mammals and planet, actually we look at that question. And is the fact that we realize that even if a number of roadkills sounds massive, if you have lots of rabbit or pheasant being killed on roads, probably not a big problem for the population. If you have a dozen of the highly endangered um, ivory and lynx <laughs> being killed on roads, that could actually be a problem for the few hundred individuals that are remaining for the species. So the second part of that paper that I talked today, and I just thought I didn't have enough time to, to share, is that we basically then took those numbers and tried to figure out how many roads is too many. And it was a way to say, when could population decline and start to occur, given the road kills that we are assuming could occur for these species? And there we find that, um, again, we, we did a look at, I can't remember at the top of my head particular species, but we did a similar uh, mapping where uh, we can see the areas where we have many species that are vulnerable. And there we again had Central Europe, but we started to have some areas kind of in the, in the Iberian Peninsula, some areas in other regions, particularly around the Alps. So roadkill is the first number that is important. The second, and it's quite clear, is this population and in some cases, even small numbers of road kills can actually be quite a problem. Yeah. Well, that's yeah useful to know. Um, now, Oli has said that he's read about animal tunnels in France, and he's asking if you think that these are effective and are they scalable? Is this something that could be done? Um, There's and actually different types of, of wildlife crossings. So, um, one of the easy ways to avoid roadkill is to prevent animals from crossing the road. So we can have fencing like occurs in some motorways and highways. And a lot of that is actually done to protect people, right? We don't, if you have an accident at high speed, then that could be quite dangerous. But of course, if we do that, then we can prevent animals from moving. So people have come up with different types of structures. So there are underpasses, there are uh, wolf, um, wildlife bridges. So there is different types of structures that can be used and they do work quite successfully. But they're not easy and they're quite expensive. And yeah. so one of the things that people often do is to figure out, first of all, where should you put them? So are there some spots where we see a lot of roadkill? Maybe this is an area where animals naturally tend to want to cross. And so that could be a good place to put these crossings. But as in a study, I was working with some colleagues in Argentina and they basically built, uh, well, they contribute to build, they didn't build themselves. They contribute to build the first uh, wildlife crossing they have there. And I visited 10 years after it had been built. And at that time, it was amazing. It really looked like a continuation of the forest. And so you can imagine these animals crossing. But when it started, it was obviously quite much more bare and much more simple. And so different animals had actually been crossing at different times. So yes, these, these mitigations can be quite good, but they're very expensive, which means they have to be designed very carefully to ensure that they actually not just a kind of face walk, like a look, greenwashing, right? Like it looks good, we're investing, but then they have little impact, yeah. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Um, now, Anthony has asked about the work you did in South Africa. And did you compare the roadside areas that had been burnt, which always tend to attract plenty of grazers versus non-burnt areas? So we, we not, at the time we went with this, not areas were clearly had been burnt. So I guess that could have been different managements, but we didn't obviously notice that and we didn't have the data on how the different areas had been managed. But I suspect what we did is we 
with our modeling took into account the different habitats because not the African savanna doesn't all look the same. In fact, there are some areas that are quite um, shrubby and, and quite dense. So we did take into account in our modeling that and that across all those different habit, habitats, we have those 10 meters as kind of the average estimate. Uh, but how animals are attracted to road burges is the whole other kind of subset of, of road ecology. This is the, the discipline is generally called road ecology, which I always think is funny because it's not the ecology of roads, but I think it gets the idea across. And, and whether animals are attracted or avoid these road burges actually varies by the preferences. Uh, and so some species can be attracted because often the grass is cut much shorter. And so grassland species might actually quite enjoy these, uh, these burges. And probably some of you have seen all of these um, ideas to use these burgess for pollinators because it's fantastic and, and you can have kind of, you plant a lot of things in there. This is an area that's kind of wasteland. We don't need it. You can leave it for pollinators. And I actually um, met Professor uh, Dave Goulson one time he gave a talk. He's, he's an expert in, on a lot of uh, pollinators and, and, and bees. And I asked him, he's like, well, could this be a double-edged sword? And, and how can we measure this? And, and the problem is that if looking at roadkill for things like birds and mammals is tricky, because even a small bat can be hard to detect, you can imagine that getting a, a roadkill bumblebee is almost impossible. So I always kind of worried about the fact that we're saying, oh yes, road bird is for pollination, this is fantastic. And maybe what we're doing is attracting all of these uh, animals and then just squashing them in the front of the car. So I think the management of these Burgess is quite interesting, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I'm pretty impressed if people can identify roadkill in um, shrews and um, voles and things, because that must be, even that must be quite challenging when they've been squashed for a while. Can I jump in, uh, Alison? Yeah. Sorry, I've, I've just got control of my computer again. It's only good, uh, well, by all means, take over. I, d I don't have to take over completely, but uh, just relevant to what was just being said, um, funnily enough, uh, because Linda and I uh, spend a lot of time walking the roads, um, we actually do uh, collect a lot of uh, insects on the, that have been road killed, um, particularly beetles we look, we're on the lookout for, but we do also actually often, often see beetles and wasps uh, and other, other sm smallish insects. Uh, and uh, um, do use that as part of our survey for for, for beetle um, purposes. Uh, just as an aside to what you what you were saying, um, but I have on a similar subject. I was absolutely astonished in your talk um, that bats showed up so highly as a, a roadkill. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if that was discussed during the time that I wasn't. Um, uh, in, in contact just now, but but uh, I, I was very curious about that, both from the fact of, wow, are bats really hit that often, and B, um, are, are they identified? Um, because in, in all the working along roads that I've been doing, I must say, I don't think I've ever found a dead bat. I suspect it varies by area. This is one of the things we clearly notice in, in our data is that not, the same species would be roadkill, would have higher or lower uh, roadkill rates in different areas. I think what happens with bats is that um, particularly at night, they can be attracted to the lights. So in roads that are uh, lit permanently, they have a street lights along. The, this is a great source of insects. Insects are attracted to lights and bats will come to get the insects. And they often fly quite low and they maneuver quite fast, but a car is also coming fast. So I think this is where these high numbers come. So I suspect that one were to survey different roads with different kind of uh, illumination, um, then we didn't have this data for all of these. Uh, we're trying to do a very large scale, which means we're losing a lot of the detail. So if you did it locally, I suspect that comparing two not too far away roads where you would expect the same kind of general community to be. The ones where there are street lights would actually probably have a much higher of, uh, number of bats. In terms of identification, I think the people who do this survey are, are amazing. And, and one of the things they do often is collect their specimens. Uh, and so identification might not necessarily occur 
in the in the you know looking at the dead animal on site but might occur later looking at bones and things like that that can be used to identify um, and in fact sometimes even that might not work so I mentioned my PhD student Pablo who's working in Ecuador and he he actually has found um, in a previous study for his master's he conducted a road kill study and he found a snake that actually was discover to science. So, so I think sometimes we can definitely find things that, um, that we don't know. Um, and I think in Europe it's probably less likely, but in places with high biodiversity like Ecuador, uh, not so unlikely, yeah. yeah. Um, uh, Phil has asked, uh, are there any plans to look at the impact of traffic reduction during the COVID phase, uh, that that, any impact that that might have had on the survival and or otherwise of the um, mammals. So I haven't done it, um, but I suspect there's a number of people, and I think the people who who's looking at probably a splatter have looked at these. Of course, it's a bit of a right. You 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 can't drive on the roads when there is a total lockdown. Therefore, how are you going to survey those roads to find a roadkill? Um, and if they have fewer reports of animals being roadkill you would assume that it would be fewer animals, but you also know there's fewer drivers, potentially fewer observers. So I, without having the data, I suspect that it clearly did have a benefit. Um, and one thing that I was actually really curious, and if I had funding, I would do, is to, to now go back to some of these African reserves, which basically now for about a year and a half, have probably had very, very low numbers of visitors. Mm. And just curious whether animals have actually adapted to that situation. Because roads are a new thing, they get there as a new threat. Um, at some point, we're pretty sure animals have it to eat, and we found that in palace, okay, they avoid generally a certain area, that they cross the other types of roads. They're not really just not coming close to the roads altogether. And now we spend a year and a half without roads. Some of these animals are fairly intelligent, and, and they can learn behavior. And I wonder if that has made a difference. So not only fewer are being killed, but have animals change their behavior and think and not see roads as so dangerous? Um, and I don't know if anybody's done that. Yeah. Anthony has actually made a comment in the chat. Paul had asked that question about COVID, and Anthony has said that um, apparently they have noticed some behavior changes in some of the private games, game reserves in South Africa, that certain species were more relaxed around new vehicles in the reserves uh, during lockdown than in normal times. So, yeah. Yeah, th th thanks for spotting that, Alison. Um, and, and changing the subject slightly, um, and in fact going off mammals, um, but not off road. Um, Sir Fest has asked, uh, he, he's, as you probably know, there's a lot of places around the UK that have toad patrols at certain times of the year to tr try and help toads across the road. Do you have any suggestions as to how the effectiveness of that could be could be measured in, in terms of is it really helping the populations or or, or not so we we don't we didn't have the data because obviously um finding finding reptiles and amphibians is even more difficult than finding mammals and, and birds in general birds not all of them but a lot have colorful um feathers so it's easier to detect that said i think amphibians and reptiles are probably much more often roadkill and the studies in which we look at all four um, groups of vertebrates we actually find amphibians and reptiles being roadkill very often so when they're all crossing the road at the same time i think stopping preventing traffic deferring could definitely have an, a benefit now the experiment to actually test it would be quite brutal, right? You would have to let the vehicles drive there, see how many they killed and see what happens. Um, I don't know the effect. Again, one of the questions could be when you're having these, these large moves, some species will produce a lot of offspring or reproduce heavily, and then a lot of individuals move, and you don't need all of them to survive. They're, in fact, the way this works is many of them will die. Um, so it is possible that Sometimes road, uh, road mortality is actually simply basically part of what the mortality would be. So maybe many of these would have been eaten by predators otherwise, and they would be gone. So it's hard to know. I, I think sometimes measures 
sound good and, and they probably are affected, but they definitely may, make us feel good as well, right? And I, I think that is still a very important thing because it has an education purpose. So, so even these reporting road kills with an app, you're not changing the impact, but it makes you aware of the problem and it makes you part of the potential solution eventually. So I think those things can be important with that aspect, even if it's not really going to make a huge difference for the overall viability of the population, it can still be quite, quite good. Is there any, this is, this is from Mina, is there any uh, evidence in any species, I wonder, of um, effectively natural roads acting as a sort of natural selection factor, that um, the ones that survive are better at crossing roads than the ones that, uh, that get killed. So that at a generational level, can one see an improvement in road crossing uh, technique? Um, on the top of my head, I'm not, I'm not remembering any study that has looked at that, um, but I, it, would quite, it would be quite interesting to see how quickly you know, you're too slow, you, you die, and therefore all the ones that are too slow eventually don't make it. Uh, so I can see how that could happen. I'm, I'm not aware of anybody who's, who's tested, uh, but we do know that animals can adapt. Um, at the same time, sometimes animals have very, um, very negative responses. So when, an, when a deer freezes on the road, that is completely the opposite of what she would do, it, right? She should kind of get out of the way, move rapidly. Uh, hedgehogs do that too. That's why they get road killed so often. They just kind of freeze, hoping you don't see them, but you're not a predator, so you're just going to run them over, unfortunately. Um, so so I, I think it's probably, it would be quite interesting, but I don't know of any studies that have, have looked at that. Okay. There's a couple of questions that we haven't asked yet um, on a similar theme from Mark and Claire and also from Mandy. Um, and saying thank you very much for an interesting talk and how do you see your findings being applied to wildlife conservation and the other question was how you know how is this going to kind of um be put to use this this use this data so well i i mentioned a couple of ways in which i thought the um the kind of african behavioral changes could be could be useful to and I think it applies similarly to Europe. So what these kind of um, estimates allow us to identify a species that might be more vulnerable in areas where we might see higher road kill rates. So we might have a species where we spec higher numbers and areas where we spec higher numbers. And these could be target uh, areas for conservation and monitoring. So systematic surveys are quite expensive. So if we can actually target uh, groups or areas where we think it's more problematic, that might be more effective than just targeting areas that for whatever reason. These larger scale, particularly the European study, when we do things at that scale, we can't really say put a wildlife cross bridge here because this is not what we're trying to do. But what we can say is, look, Central Europe seems to be an area where a lot of animals are killed. And actually Central Europe is an area where we do have quite a few live wild crossings, so they know this problem but we still have some gaps in our knowledge. So can we use these to identify um, areas where maybe we should be serving and, and prioritize those areas over other uh, regions? And similarly for a species, can we, most people when they do a road kill survey, what they do is they just look for whatever they can find, but we could basically alter the way in which we survey, reducing the speed or paying particular attention to certain groups if we think they're quite vulnerable, um, so I think that those are some ways in yeah. which these, they, these information can be used. Yeah. Okay, I, I think uh, we've probably exhausted uh, all, all the questions that were listed in the chat. Um, and we're also just hitting eight o'clock. Bob, Anthony has just asked if he could unmute himself and comment on animal behavior. Okay. Okay. Go ahead. Anthony, are you there? Yeah, sorry, I'm trying to unmute myself. Um, yeah, it was just very interesting what Bob was asking about in terms of the animals side of things, because um, having sort of grown up in South Africa and visited the parks zillions of times, um, and I sort of generally go back every year to go and visit them, and I go off to Kenya quite regularly as well, is one of the things that I have that 
colleagues, friends, or not really colleagues, but friends of mine out there who sort of are, are um, zoologists, um, what they have found is at times that some of the predators have actually changed their behavior, especially in the Kruger Park around vehicles, and they actually use the vehicles to hunt. Um, because one of the things that they found is that a lot of the animals like Impala and things like that, they can't, they, they slide very easily on the tar roads. And so they, they've learned to take advantage of that and will chase them onto the tar roads. And then invariably often these animals and sort of kudu and things like that, which are top heavy, will often then slide on the tar roads and they're obviously easy pickings for them. Ah. So. Thank you for that. Actually, more generally, especially non-paved roads, that um, carnivores actually sometimes use roads as a, as a way to move in the landscape because it's a nice path, right? It's clear of vegetation. You can just walk a straight. So this is why sometimes they're, they're, um, they become victims of roadkill because they're actually using the road as, as the way to move around the landscape. Yeah, so I've seen some... I, I haven't seen a study, but I've seen anecdotal evidence and of, of that effect where the lions... Um, they, they clearly look like they want to put the animals into the road because they know that's like a good place to, to hunt them. So yeah, quite interesting. Excellent insight. Okay, um, so thank you very much, Manuela. Uh, wonderful talk and, and excellent uh, fielding of the questions. Um,